Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Good. Um, We're going to do actually a series the next two weeks leading up to Easter called Only Hope. Because I don't know about you guys, but as I've been looking around over the last year, two years, I've been looking around at the world and going, what is happening? Anybody ever had just like, you just think it can't get more insane. And then you hear something, you're like, it just got more insane. Like, what is happening? What is going on in the world? This is crazy. And we're all looking around going, you know, we know deep within us, it shouldn't be this way. But we're like, this is just crazy. And it just keeps, seems like it keeps getting crazier. There's uh, when I, went to, when I was a kid, my, my parents moved us to Guatemala, and Guatemala is down in Central America, and there's a lot of volcanoes and stuff around, and within about a few weeks of us getting there, uh, we experienced our first earthquake. I don't know if you've ever been through an earthquake, but it's a weird feeling, because you're like, wait a second. You, first of all, you feel the sensation before you realize what's actually happening, and it happened in the middle of the night, and I remember feeling my bed shaking. I'm like, what's going on? We wake up. My dad and I, my mom are like, we need to get out into the street. So we get out into the street, and we wait for it to go. But over the next few hours, there's several aftershocks. There's more earthquakes. And I had never experienced anything like this. And it's a weird feeling when the ground beneath your feet is shaking. In fact, you're always kind of wondering, like, you'll be going throughout the day, and you start to think, wait, is the ground shaking again? When the ground has shaken under your feet, you start to question everything. Well, then, just a few days later, the volcanoes started going crazy. So there's these aftershocks of earthquakes, and these volcanoes are going crazy so much so they had to shut down the airport because there was so much ash in the air. There's this gray haze hanging in the air. And I remember going to a missionary there, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think it's the end of the world. And he had lived there for 30 years in Guatemala, and he said, no, it's not the end of the world. He said, it's a season change. In Guatemala, we found out they have two seasons. They have the rainy season and the dry season. And he said, you always know when seasons are going to change because the earth starts to shake and the volcanoes start to explode. He said, yeah, you don't need to worry. It just means seasons are changing. And I thought, man, what a message that is for us because, you know, when things start to shake, everything we've counted on, we start to go, what's happening? And when you've walked in the faith a while, you start to go, oh, you know what? It's just God at work. He's doing his thing. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Hebrews. He said this. He said, look, God has promised this. This is what he's promised. Yet once more, I'm going to shake not only earth, but the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, where it says yet once more, it indicates the removal of things that aren't shaken. That is things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. So from time to time, God will go, I'm going to shake things up just to remind people what's unshakable. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of shaking. And some of us are freaking out. We're like, the whole world is changing. What happened to the country we used to know and love? Where is everything going? And God's like, hey, I'm not shaking. Everything else is shaking, but I'm right here. And it says this. It says, therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, recognizing When God shakes things, the response is, what's he trying to say to us here? For our God is a consuming fire. There's this tendency when God starts to shake things, we all start to look around and go, we we all say something like this. Someone save me, please. And I know this about everybody in this room this morning. There's some area of your life right now where you're waiting for the cavalry to show up and save you. With your relationship with your son or daughter, you're watching them destroy themselves and you've been trying your hardest to get them back on track and it's not working. And you're like, God, please do something. Somebody come and save us. You're looking for a counselor to talk to your son or some mentor, like the right person in their life to get him back on track. And we're like, somebody come and save us. Maybe in your finances, you just, man, you've been trying to do it right, but their finances, you just keep taking hit after hit after expense after expense, and you're just like, somebody come and save me. You're like, man, you're waiting for, waiting for that next government stimulus check, because you're like, somebody needs to save me. <laughs> Some of you are still waiting for your tax return from two years ago, aren't you? I've been talking to a lot of people like, yeah, I've been waiting two years for my tax return. We're all, we all have an area of our life where we're going, save me. Some of us are looking at our country, and we're like, Save us, somebody. This is crazy. What's happening? This isn't the country I grew up in. 
Some of you in your marriage, you've been trying and trying and trying and you're just waiting. You're like, man, I, somebody save me. I need to read the right book or watch the right video or somebody talk to my husband or somebody talk to my wife. Somebody save me. We've all got an area of our lives where we're going, we're waiting for the cavalry to show up and save us. Right? And when things start shaking, we all naturally look up because there's this instinct within us that we know there's something bigger than us. In fact, anybody that ever tells you an atheist, they're an atheist, is not telling the truth. Because we all worship God always. We are programmed to worship God. It just depends on what we're labeling as God. And the, tr the human tradition has been this. We're down here and God's up here. And here's what happens. Whoever or whatever we believe will save us becomes our God. We start to worship whatever we think will save us. And what it ends up looking like, though, is because God's so high up there, we usually are a little bit intimidated. So we go, somebody talk to God for me. I need a priest to talk to God for me. You'll remember like with, with, with the children of Israel, when God was talking to Moses up on the mountain, they started freaking out because all they saw was thunder and lightning. And they called Aaron, uh, Moses' uh, brother, and said, hey, uh, you, we need you to intervene. Like, we're scared here. We don't know what's going on. And so this is where there's this tendency within all of us to look for a higher power, but we don't want to go to the p higher power directly. We want somebody to talk to the higher power for us. And you're like, what do you mean, Joel? Well, let me give you an example. For some of us, the higher power is the government. And these are our priests. Whoever you want, right? Somebody fix the government. And you picked who you thought would be the inter intervention to talk to the government for you, whoever it was. I'm going to step on everyone's toes this morning, so y'all calm down, okay? Some of you are like, oh man, is he going to go political? I'm not going political. I'm just saying this is how we are. When things start going crazy, we look for somebody to talk to the higher power, whoever we think it will be that will save us. And some people think, man, if we can just get the government to take care of people, everything will be okay. And one of these guys becomes our priest. For some people, the government is God, and that's who they worship. And the religious instinct doesn't go away. You just redirect it towards another God. Now, the Bible indicates there's no other God but God. So what those are actually called are idols. But we won't talk about that right now. For some, their God is science. Science will save me. I know science will save me, and I'm so grateful for science. But we need a priest. I actually heard this goober say the other day, I represent science. He literally said that. But isn't that the way we humans are? We're looking for somebody to represent for us. Hey, tell me what God's saying. What's the God of science saying today? Well, today he's saying. Well, tomorrow he's saying. Well, now the God of science is saying. That's the scary thing about a lot of our gods is they change their mind a lot. And we're putting hope in something that's changing its mind all the time. For some people, education and philosophy are the God. If we could just educate people enough, no country would invade another country because we'll all be civilized. And then a country gets invaded, like Ukraine, and everybody's like, how did this happen? We're all educated and civilized. Apparently, that's not the answer. That God didn't save us. Some believe in utopian philosophies. Marxism is a utopian philosophy. It's not realistic, but it's a great idea. If it worked, but it doesn't work. People are like, if we can just get everybody to believe this way, we'll be saved. Philosophy will save us. But what happens is those things don't save us. And what ends up happening is we feel hopeless when the God we expected to save us doesn't do what we believed she or he would do. And we start going, it's hopeless. It's hopeless. I don't know if I can do this. And we get disillusioned with our priests and we vote them out or fire them. The religious instinct never goes away and everyone worships God. It's just who they label God. Don't ever doubt that because everyone is looking for somebody to save them. And whatever we believe will save us becomes our God. Now as Christians, we believe that there is only one hope and that's Jesus. But the tendency that we have is we all tend to go back to those other things because this is the challenge. God's always doing 10,000 things behind the scene because that's who he is. He's God. He's just got all the plates spinning and he's got them under control. 
but we only see maybe three things he's doing. And so we look and we, we, we watch the news report and we're like, the world's going crazy, but they're not gonna report on what God's doing behind the scenes because they can't see it, nor can we. So we have to trust that he's working behind the scenes. And God is always working behind the scenes, but we start getting disillusioned. And so what'll often happen is we'll start putting our hope in something we can see instead of the things we can't see. Because what we can see, we're like, well, at least we know when that, that's working or not working. That's why a lot of people put their hope in the government because they're like, that's power. That's raw power. We can see if that works, when that works and when it doesn't work. Most of the time it doesn't work because that's just, it's, it's, it's just a flawed system. Every system, it was a, a, Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government that has ever been except for all the rest. <laughs> Every government system has flaws. So Paul picks up this idea. He says, look, Every one of us, we're looking for hope. We're looking for this God to come and like save us. And we're looking for these priests. But this is what Paul says. Now, listen, Paul says some really weird things, okay? I'm not going to brush over this. Every time I read Paul, I get frustrated. A lot of people tell me like, I try and read the Bible, but I don't understand it. And I'm like, welcome to the club. I've been reading the thing for 44 years, and I still don't understand half of what Paul says. In fact, the apostle Peter, you know, the guy that hung out with Jesus, there's one verse where he says, I don't understand half of what Paul says. It's really weird, but I know he's onto something. <laughs> That's encouraging if Peter himself says it. He's like, what Paul says is hard to understand, but I, he's right, but I don't know what he's talking about, right? So if, you're, if you don't understand what Paul's saying, you're in good company because I don't understand it and neither did Peter. But here's one of the things that Paul says that's super profound, okay? He says this, when God made a promise to Abraham... Now, he's talking to the children of Israel, right? And for the children of Israel, Abraham is their father. I don't know if you grew up in church. Some of us sang, sang a song called Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Yeah, that's, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so God came to Abraham and said, Abraham, through you, I'm going to save the world. Through your family lineage, I've got a plan to save the world. So he comes to Abraham and says, I've got a promise. Since he had no one greater by whom... whom he had no one greater by whom to swear. He swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. Now this is, you know, when you go to the court and you have to like swear, you, you swear on the Bible. What, what that is, is that's symbolic of swearing on something that's higher than you that if you're lying, is gonna make you pay, right? Well, God's like, I swear to God. I swear on myself because he's God. He's like, because what you're doing is you're appealing to a higher authority and God's like, well, I am the highest authority. There's nobody higher to appeal to. So I'm swearing based on my certainty. And this is where he says, and thus Abraham, having patiently waited, it took a while. It may take a while for the promise God gave you to come to pass. The thing you're waiting for, for him to save you from, it may take a while, but he patiently waited. He obtained the promise. And for, for people swear by something greater than themselves and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God wanted to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, that's the people who were going to receive the promise of the salvation, that they're going to be saved from what's, what they're struggling with. He says, when he made the promise, the, the unchange, to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. He promised based on his own certainty. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, God will not lie. People will lie. We lie to ourselves. God never lies. He tells the truth. And it may be bigger than we can understand at the time, like some of the stuff Paul's saying. And we're like, what in the world? But just because we don't understand it, it doesn't mean it's not true. We have to seek out the truth. We who have let, fled for refuge might have a strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope. There's that word hope set before us. It says God is never going to change and he's always going to come through. And that's your hope. And he's like, so you can hold on to that. And this is what he says this. And we have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. This song I wrote, the second verse says, there's an anchor that will hold sure and steadfast for my soul. And that's, that wasn't me who wrote that. It's too eloquent for me. That's straight from the Bible. A hope that enters, and this is where it gets weird, okay? So stick with me. I'm gonna unpack this. This is where you're like, Paul, what are you talking about? He says, and that's a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, huh? Where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek? What? You read this and you're like, what in the world is he talking about? Paul, just be clear, man. Like, wouldn't that be great on the Hallmark thing? Hallmark card? 
become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. What is that? There's no encouragement in that, but there is encouragement in that. And we're going to unpack what that means. Paul is talking to Hebrews who understood something. They understood this religious impulse that we all have, that we fall short of the glory of God. And we have, in order to worship God, we have to approach him very carefully because he's still God. And they understood that a priest, when God set up the Hebrew religion, he said, a priest needs to come and talk to me because you've got sins that need to be forgiven. And if you want your sins forgiven, you've got to do the right things. You've got to follow the right procedure and you've got to sacrifice a living animal for your sins. And the way this all went down was in the temple or the tabernacle. This was the way the tabernacle was structured. If you read like Leviticus and all these, you know, those uh, numbers and Leviticus, there's all these weird rules God set up. All of it's symbolic of what Jesus would eventually become. But he's like, I need you to follow these rules very carefully. He said, I need you to have this outer court. Now, anybody can get in here, okay? The outer court, anybody could get in here. But these two areas, only the priests could go into. Because God dwelled right here in an area called the holiest of holies. And it said there was a cloud that would hover above this. And they really, I mean, God actually in, in, in form before Jesus came, when God lived with humanity, God's always been dwelling with humanity, but it's been in different forms. When he was here, he hung out right there in that holiest of holies. So this was a very sacred place. Normal people couldn't get in there. What you do is you tell the priest, priest, I screwed up. Can you go please talk to God for me and, and tell him what I did and then sacrifice an animal so I'm clean, good to go? And some of you, you know, you, you came from a Catholic background, so you know how this goes. Forgive me, Father. Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And, and then you confess your sins to the priest and supposedly he gives you absolution. We all know this, right? This is the instinct. But this is where things get really fascinating when Jesus showed up. So when the priest would come in, they would, once a year, they would, make a, they would walk into this place where God was dwelling himself and they would make a sacrifice. Now, the scary thing about this was if they didn't follow exact procedures, they would get struck dead by God. There's a story of Moses. He had two nephews named Nadab and Abihu. Abihu. They did something wrong. It says they burned strange fire. Nobody really knows what that means, but they started burning the wrong sacrifice and God struck them both down. Talk about the fear of the Lord. Can you imagine some of y'all after what you did last night, if you came in here and all of a sudden you fell down dead, we'd know what you'd been up to. <laughs> Must have not been living right. And some of you thought that when you came in this morning, the walls were going to cave in on you, but they didn't. And do you know why? Because Jesus right. paid the price for your sins. Hallelujah. And it's not about you. It's not about how good you can be. In fact, the, the book of Isaiah, it says, all your goodness this is going to be really offensive to your ears that this is what he said. All your offenses, all your goodness is like tampons, used ones at that. That's literally what the translation is. That's disgusting. Some of you are like, I can't believe he just said that. That's literally what the translation says. It's the, the rags that women used during their period. That's what all your righteousness is like. God doesn't like it. Because on your best day, on my best day, we don't add up. And when he looks at that, he's like, no, no. Why don't you just keep that over here? You can come in because of Jesus. Amen. 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 And all your goodness. Some of you are thinking, man, once I get good enough, I'll start, you know, serving in church. Eh, no, that's not how it works. You right now, if you've accepted the gift of Christ, are the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So this is what would happen is these priests would come in here and it was such a dangerous and scary thing that they would actually tie a rope around the priest in case he hadn't followed procedure right and he died. I'm not going in to get him. Neither am I. God might strike me down. So they'd haul him out, haul his lifeless body out with a rope. That's how serious it was. This, this, this veil right here protected the people from God's wrath, essentially, until a priest came in and would make a sacrifice. And this is what Paul's talking about when he says that this confidence we have goes behind the veil. Because if you'll remember, when Jesus died, it says the veil in the temple, this huge giant veil, super thick veil to protect people from God was torn from the top to the bottom. And God was basically saying, we're all good. Now I'm unleashing myself upon you. And now God doesn't live here anymore. He lives in you. That's right. Amen. The same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in you and you don't have to be afraid. Amen. 
You don't have to be afraid to go to God. You can go straight to God. And this is what, but, but, but uh, the apostle Paul says this, since then we have a high priest who passed through the heavens. Jesus became the ultimate priest. He's like, we don't need to sacrifice lambs anymore. I'm going to sacrifice myself. Jesus, the son of God, let us hold fast our confession because we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Jesus came and lived on earth and he gets what it's like to struggle with the very same things you struggle with. But you know what? He didn't fall for it. It says, but one who in every way has been tempted as we are, but without sin. He became the spotless lamb, the perfect lamb, lived a perfect life, and then he took all of your sins upon him, like that animal that you used to have to sacrifice and take to the temple. Jesus became that one. He became the ultimate high priest. And it says, so without sin, so let us then, because of Jesus, let us with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's your hope right there, y'all. It hadn't ha doesn't have anything to do with what you've done, what you haven't done, what you failed to do, what you've messed up. Your standing before God has nothing to do with you. All you have to do is accept the free gift of Jesus. Now listen, some of you go, well, that's too good to be true. And here's what I'm learning, and the older I get, if it seems, if grace seems too good to be true, you're probably just now starting to understand it because it is too good to be true. Because we all know we need somebody to save us and we all feel separated from God and that's why we look to the priest to do it. But now we don't need a priest. In fact, this is what, this is what it says in Peter. Check this out. It says, as you come to him, as you're looking to come to God because of your, you can now approach the throne of grace. You don't have to have a priest do it for you. You don't have to do all the right things. You don't have to make the sign of the cross and say all these Hail Marys. You literally can go straight to God when you've messed up. Amen. And it says, and as you come to him, the living stone, that's God himself, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, God in the form of Jesus, you also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house and get this, to be a holy priesthood, Amen. offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now this is where it gets really crazy because not only did Jesus make you worthy, he also said, and now, now that you're worthy and everything's clean between you and God, he's not mad at you anymore. You've got a mission. Your new mission is you are the priest. You are the one called to tell people, hey, you can be directly connected with God. He forgave my sins. He can do the same thing for you. And that is your mission. You let your light shine before men and women, the whole world, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. You don't need a priest anymore. You have direct access to God. And that's good news because there's some days I don't feel very worthy. And Jesus says, yeah, you're not worthy, but I made you worthy. So come on in, approach the throne of grace. But, don't, but not only that, it's one thing to sit in the hope of the fact that we've been saved, but there's even more to it. That hope should drive you forward in your role as a priest. And this is no small thing. The Reformation with Martin Luther, the guy that broke off and started the Protestant Reformation, this was one of his things called the priesthood of every believer. He's like, we don't need a priest to talk to God for us. Jesus did that job. And then he turned us loose on the earth as priests. You're like, well, I don't feel very much like a priest. Well, you are. Sometimes you got to fake it till you make it. <laughs> you are a priest. You are the person that is now called to walk before others and show them the hope that is within you. You are a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may go on your mission of declaring the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And that is your mission on earth. And since we have this hope, we are very bold. Right now in our world, there are people looking for somebody to save them. And they're calling out for the government. And the government's failing. And they're looking to science. And science is failing. They're looking to education, and education is failing. But there's one thing that won't fail. It's the unshakable kingdom. Yes. Come on now, that. Thank you, Lord. And that is the confidence we have. And we have, and, and listen, in that confidence, it doesn't make us arrogant. It makes us very humble because we recognize we don't deserve it. But because of Jesus, we walk around with this deep-seated sense of hope that I know what it looks like around me. I know everything's going crazy. I know the world is insane. They're telling 
They're telling kids now that men can have babies. I'm like, well, good luck with that. <laughs> and people are believing it. And you're like, how can anybody believe it? Well, they're deceived and they're lied to. But here's the thing. You don't have to go preaching people by more, telling them how immoral they are and how wrong they are. They already know they need something to save them. That's why they're looking to all this gender identity stuff and they're looking for this identity over here. They're looking for education. They're crying out for somebody to save them because we're all crying out for somebody to save us. Amen. You don't have to go tell them, well, you're wicked. And, I mean, you don't have to do that. We all have this deep sense within us that we, we're short of what we need to be. And the goal that we have is this. We've got to make sure that our hope is found in nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And we don't trust the sweetest frame. This is an old hymn but we boldly, tr solely trust in Jesus' name. Amen. And it's tempting, man. When you start watching the news, you go, oh man, if we could just get the right guy in charge, we'd be all saved. Probably not. Man, if we could just figure out the science on this, we'd all be saved. If we could just educate everybody. And it's easy to fall for that because it's tangible. It's something we can hold on to. But remember, we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. The verse, the full verse in Romans 5 says this, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And through him, we've also obtained access into that holiest place. Through him, we've also obtained access by grace into this faith in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. More than this, we rejoice in our suffering because we know that suffering produces endurance Endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope will not put you to shame because God's love has been poured into your hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. That's our hope. Amen. And what happens is when you start looking to other gods, they'll eventually let you down. And listen to me, Christians, even Christians, we're prone to do this. We know Jesus is the hope of the world, but we start looking to other things and they'll always disappoint. And when you look to other things, you start feeling anxiety. And that's why the apostle Paul says this, be anxious for nothing, but in everything through prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God Amen. and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And that's what we need right now. We need people who are well aware of the chaos around them. You don't need to check out and go live in a monastery or something, check out of the world. You need to be somebody who's walking with confidence in an insane world where people are going, what is happening to our country? What is happening to people? And they're having their, their hope is in the human spirit. No, there's no hope there because you've seen humans. You've driven on the road. You know how they drive, right? Don't count on hope in the human spirit. It'll let you down. My hope is in this. My hope that, nope, 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 nope. People want to look at you. And, and when you're walking in confidence, you don't even have to really even say anything. You just have to carry that confidence around, that peace that transcends all understanding. It goes beyond understanding. Like, based on the circumstances around me, I should be nervous, but there's this peace within me because I have this confidence that my only hope is in Jesus, period. And when you walk that way, it gets people's attention because everybody needs to be saved. And when we call out, even the people, listen, even the people who say they're atheists and don't believe in God, they have a God. It's just themselves. And eventually they'll let themselves down and they'll start calling out, somebody save me. And you'll humbly say, hey, I know a guy. <laughs> I know a guy that can do that because he's the one that saved me. And you don't have to be brash, but you definitely need to be bold. You need to be willing at any time, Paul says, to give a reason for the hope that's within you. And that's where we're at right now. It's a wonderful time to be alive. You go, it's a wonderful time to be alive. No, it really is. Because as the dark gets darker, the light gets lighter. And the dark knows where to go to. And with that confidence, man, I've heard it said, you can charge the gates of hell with a water pistol, knowing that the gates of hell will not prevail against you, which is what we're gonna talk about next week. The hope of the world in the church. You guys receive this? Yes, Man, some of you guys, this is a week you just need to turn off the TV, stop watching the social media. Because, you know, it's not the, it's not the, it's, it's the cumulative effect of all, those all that negativity that adds up. You see one thing in the morning, then you see something at noon. Just turn all that off and open your Bible and start reading in the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Because he is our only hope, no matter how bad and chaotic things get. And right now, because you are a royal priesthood, you can go straight to him. You've got direct access to the most powerful force in the universe. He's on your side.
One touch of his favor can change everything in an instant. When he breathes in your direction, nobody's gonna stop him. He'll kick open doors, nobody else can open, and it'll happen right in the middle of all the chaos around you. The righteous will flourish in the land. You guys receive that? Father, we thank you so much for your gift of Jesus Christ, man. It is, we're doomed without him, but with him, we are very bold. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence. So I pray for those this morning, man. They've, they've been putting their hope and their ability to navigate this situation with their kids or to navigate the situation with their spouse or trying to figure out how to figure out the finances or, or whatever it is, their business. Lord, I pray that today we would recognize that our only hope is in you and we would surrender the other gods, the idols we've been worshiping and say, God, these aren't real gods. The only real God is my source. And he swore a promise that he would bless his children. He swore it on himself so we can have confidence in that. Pray for anyone here this morning that's just, man, they've been feeling the anxiety, the weight of everything going on in the world. Lord, I pray that the peace that transcends all understanding would guard their hearts and minds. And as they walk boldly in this dark world, a light to the nations, I pray, Lord, that they would see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. If you're here this morning and you do not have your relationship right with Jesus, I'm gonna give you a chance to get that fixed. You already know who you are. You've been feeling it in your heart. The Holy Spirit has been speaking to you as we've been giving this message. We're going to say a prayer in a second. If you say this prayer and you mean it with your whole heart, God is going to come. He's going to forgive your sins. He's going to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, get you, set you an eternal address in eternity. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. In your name, amen. If you are ever in the Seguin area, Come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.